Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Lawless Podcast. And this week's episode is a very special one because we're joined by Bethany from Without a Compass. Hi everyone, I'm Bethany and I'm from Taiwan as an exchange student doing my year abroad here in Durham. Nice one. So yeah, today's podcast is going to be focusing on looking at Taiwanese culture, history and all things Taiwan. We're going to be giving you everything you need to know to visit Taiwan and and yeah, really immerse you in the culture and what Taiwan has to offer. So just to begin, Bethany, I'd just like to ask you a little about the food and drink of Taiwan. What are the main sort of uh, sort of dishes and what would people usually eat? Um, when people think about Taiwan, it's <laughs> the first thing that comes to the mind is bubble tea, and people do actually drink that. Because like, it's when I think about British people, and I think of like maybe you drink beer a lot or like tea a lot. That's definitely true. Yeah. And but I think with the UK you don't have like British food in general. <laughs> We'd have sort of like a range from street food to high end restaurants. Yes, like a scale. Yeah, like with street food you get with night markets. So that's where you get all sort of like typical Taiwanese food you think of, like uh, bubble tea, ji pai. And ji pai is like. <laughs> Fried chicken. Yeah, it can get as big as your face, and wow. you could yeah, you could flavor it with like black pepper, um, seaweed, anything, and then also like lu rou fan. It's like a bowl of rice with something similar to gravy and pork on them, and you also get like pickled radish, and then a lot of noodles. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you think of, or like anything you want to know? Um, yeah. So, what would you recommend? What would you say? Let's say I've got a day, a day in Taiwan, and I had to eat throughout the day. What would be my sort of meals I'd have? Do you have like breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Is it structured like that? Or oh, breakfast. We have. I don't think this could be found anywhere else in the world. But we have like a breakfast culture. Okay. We have breakfast culture. It's. We get breakfast shops specifically for breakfast, so wow. they would open from maybe from earlier, from like four or five a.m. till eleven a.m. Wow. That's when they close. So like really That's specifically <laughs> for yeah, breakfast, yeah. and so you get like the more modernized or westernized shops that sell like maybe sandwiches, um, hamburgers, noodles, and like. The typical order would be a large iced milk tea, with a thing we call tamping. It's a bit like egg roll, so you have like a thing similar to a wrap, and then you have an egg on them, and then you roll them up, and you can basically put anything you like in the middle. So like cheese, corn, tuna, dried pork, uh, anything you name really. That's the more like the modernized version of it, but you also get like more traditional ones where you get also the egg roll thing, and also like um, soya drink, sweetened ones, oh, yeah. and then salty ones. So salty ones are more like soup, so they could they look a bit like porridge in a way, and you put like vinegar or um, spicy sauce on them. And then we put definitely you have to put um, it's called fried breadstick in English, but it's oh yeah, <laughs> but it's like you sort of cut them into pieces and then sprinkle them on top. That's really nice. And then you also have like you can have rice porridge with um, dried pork, uh, pickles, peanuts, many other stuff. Nice one. So um yeah, so that's basically what we'd eat in a day if we were there. <laughs> But that's specifically for breakfast. Yeah, that, well, that's just breakfast. Yeah. Wow, two more meals. Yeah. What, what would we have for lunch then? Lunch like would be pretty simple. Um, if it, if you want to get more like the Taiwanese experience, I'd say you, one thing I really love is uh, 鱼酥羹. I'm not even sure how I could translate that into yeah, English. Yeah. But it's a bit like um, soup. That is a bit... Um, Sticky? Yeah, sticky it's, soup. Yeah, and then you put a thing that is fried. It's not like the texture of the f- fish, but more like um, crispy, but it's made of fish. 
Oh yeah, nice, yeah. Nice. <laughs> you you could also put noodles in that in that soup, but some people don't have it with noodles. So it's like whatever you want to have, sort of. Yeah, thing, yeah,、right? yeah. Basic. I think a lot of things with Taiwanese food is basically what just what you want, what you yeah, like. Yeah. yeah, nice one. So yeah, what would you have for dinner as well? Dinner, because、uh, I usually eat at home. My my grandma cooks, but I think for dinner a lot of people either they dine out or they cook for themselves. Yeah. Or they just get microwave food from convenience stores. <laughs> nice. <one. laughs> If they're busy at work, yeah. Nice. So, would you live? Would you live just like with your parents, or do you live with more of your family, or is that normal for more of your family to live together? Or yeah, I think、uh, most people would still be living with their parents in university. It's like half half. It's not like here. I I see that maybe people would move out to go、yeah. to university, but I say it's half half in Taiwan. If like me, I stay. In、uh, where I grew up to study university, so I still live at home, and I live both my with my parents and my grandparents. I think that's also not maybe half half, but more like forty to sixty、uh, people who live with their grandparents and people who don't. Nice. So like, yeah, would would most people live like that? Live with their extended family, so with their grandparents or like aunties and uncles, or is that common or not really? I think it it's common. It's quite common, yeah. Especially if you're not living in the city, yeah. You'd be, li- be living with her, your whole family if it's in like older days, yeah. And for me, it's like because I live with my grandparents, but we live in the same apartment, just different rooms. So we're、yeah. right next to each other. But with a friend of mine, she's living on the same roof, and so there isn't much space for her to live on her own. So she has to be sleeping with her siblings. I think that's quite common in Taiwan as well. But I've also know people who sleep in the same room with their parents at my age. Wow, in、yeah. the same room. Yeah. So I、oh. think that's another thing because most、uh, universities here have like. A single room, so yeah, you'd get your yeah, own yeah. bed. But in my home university, you get a room with six people. That's quite a lot. Six people, me, in six people,、wow. yeah, in university. So people here are complaining about having a roommate. You can have five more <laughs> in the same room. Yeah, but I went in there. The living condition, I wouldn't say, is the best. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. really cramped、yeah. with that many people. I'd、I don't. Imagine, yeah. yeah, I don't like it. <laughs>、no. How would you get any sort of privacy with that many people in the room? Yeah,、room? I, I just can't imagine. I mean, I, I know I'm, I need my own space, so it's really nice here. You get your own room. Exactly. Yeah. Better than having six people. Do you people. live with your? Is it common to like sleep with your parents at this age, or do you get really get your own room throughout? So when you say sleep with your parents, do you mean in the same bed or like in a different bed in the same room? It could be both. So、it、you can have people、be. who stay in the same bed with their parents. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. At, at like eighteen or nineteen. Yep. The same bed. The same bed. <laughs> I can see you. Look, you look really shocked.、You、yeah, really that's、shocked. not a thing. No way. No way. That would never happen here, like at all. Wow. I think like after like the age of three, even that sort of pushing it a bit. It, you'd only go in there like. I don't know, unless you had a problem at night, say I don't know you were scared or something about some something,、mm-hmm. then go into your parents' room, maybe stay in there if you start for a bit of comfort. But on a regular, n- would not happen at all. So at nine, so let me let me get straight. If someone's someone's twenty or nineteen, they could still sleep in the same bed with their parents. Yeah, I have、wow. a friend or two who it who do that. Yeah. Wow. But I don't、yeah. think it's because they have a choice, but more because. They're living in a really small. Because there's room. no room that you have、yeah. to. It's not by you know, by choice. No, <laughs> I don't think they. If they could choose it, I mean, a lot of people do want to move out when yeah, they are yeah, yeah. when they study in university because they could get out of the house. <laughs> get in their own bed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, nice one. So yeah, um, going on to sort of what we talked about earlier about the meat culture. So you said there's more of a meat culture in the UK than、uh, in Taiwan. Yeah, you don't. People don't have like. Steak, or just like that. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> a block of meat. <laughs> a block of meat. Yeah, I don't、yeah. think people do that. We sort of、mm, we have a. I think it's another thing I notice is that you have more variety of ways of cooking、yeah. in the oven, like we do on the hob. 
we yeah. don't have that many varieties in the oven. People usually use the oven to bake stuff. Yeah. But we do do more varieties on the hob where we cook, we stir fry, we. I don't. I couldn't even find English words for it, but it's oh, like yeah. yeah. And so, what happens at the normal family dinner is you get your own bowl of rice, and then you sort of use that bowl with. You put stuff into a bowl. It's in the middle of the table. Yeah. Yeah. There's like all sorts of dishes in on the on the table, and people just pick the stuff out whenever they want. So I think. Um, because all of my flatmates are uh, one of except one of them are all others are all British, and I've heard from other people from Taiwan and Hong Kong as well. Is that when like during Lunar Year when they try to do something with their flatmates when they cook and they eat together with them, the British people just sort of at a loss of what to do because yeah, that yeah. yeah they would they would be describing like my one friend from Hong Kong she described it at. Like so, the British people they would be sort of passing the plates around to yeah. pick up stuff, and that's what you normally do. But we don't do it that way. We just have the plates on the table, and we pick it up whenever we want. Yeah, it's not sort of like load your plate up and then eat. It's sort of like when everyone want it, it's in the middle of the table. Yeah, we do it okay. in that one. Makes yeah, sense. I think because I went over to a British friend's house, and we just sort of pick everything up before we start eating. Yeah. That's not how we do it. Oh yeah, so that that is definitely a different cultural thing. So if you just have like a Sunday roast or a big family meal, before you start, you'd, again, you pass the plates to the left and pass them around, and then let everyone fill their plates, and then whatever's left goes in the middle for whoever wants sort of more. Oh, it's not sort of like okay. every time you'd you know pick off the middle. Yeah, so that's interesting how that's different. You know, I wonder why. Do you why, start you know. like? Well, obviously, we're more in like a secular society now, but do you still like? Pray before you start your meal, or what do you do to sort of start eating? I think like it depends on the family. So if you're in like a Christian family, then you will. But if you're not, then it would just be like whoever cooked the meal. When everyone sat down, like the head of like the table would go, "Yeah, sure, go oh, ahead, oh, eat." Okay. So whoever cooked the meal, like sort of when they sit down, it's like yeah. Because with us, it's usually when the oldest people at the table start eating, you start eating. Yes,、yeah, so、or when that, they yeah, say yeah. you could start eating, yeah, yeah,、so、very similar to us, yeah. Nice one. So let's just move on a bit now to sort of what we what you drink. You said about hot water. Tell us about that. <laughs> That's just what, and、um, because on my own podcast episode, it, it's in the first episode where we talked about drinking hot water. It's um, people here just find that concept really weird. Yeah, yeah, just having the hot <laughs> But water. But it's like. It's such a normal thing to do with in Taiwan. You don't even think about it. It's you just. I think it has to do with、uh, the concept of Chinese medicine. So it's having something like similar to your body temperature go in, so、yeah. it doesn't make your organs sort of like freeze up a little bit when you drink、yeah. like normal temperature water. Right. Exactly. So, how warm would it be? Like just warm or hot or how? Like for me, I'm personally I can't really drink that hot water, so I would mix、right. it up a bit with like hot water and cold water, so you get like the middle temperature. So it's about to start like yeah. So、middle. like with a normal f- water fountain in in Taiwan, you get three different kinds of temperature. You get the boiled hot one, the warm one, and the cold one. Yeah. Yeah, I just think What, you、really? have yeah. You、wow. you don't I don't think you have that sort of water fountain here. People just open a tap and drink. That's、yeah. something I find really bizarre when I first came, and I've spent some time trying to get over. Like I'm、yeah. drinking from the tap. Yeah. So you you wouldn't drink from the tap in Taiwan at all. No, it's I don't think it because I think the process water is processed differently or like filtered differently, so you can't just directly drink from the tap. So it have to come from a water fountain. Uh. Uh, my family would sort of like boil it and then store it in like a bottle or something, so we could just drink it whenever. But、nice. when outside, when you're like at school or at in the office or like in the library, you get water fountains. Nice、yeah. one. So yeah,、um, if so, let's say we, I was to go visit. So I've gone to Taiwan. I've just got off the plane. I've landed in Taipei. Yep. Which is the capital, as I just learned. <laughs> So what? Yeah, what would you recommend visiting? What if I had say a few days? What would you say to go and go and have a look at? 
Well, it's like what I do when I first go to London to see like maybe Big Ben, the Tower of London. You go to first go to like the tourist attractions. So I'd say Taipei One Hundred One, and because we're not like we're really close to nature, the Taipei is quite is quite a small capital city. I'd say so. It's really convenient f- to go from like the middle of the city where. People and traffic are bustling to、so、like a really quiet con like countryside vibe place. So with Taipei One Hundred One, you could get like a、uh, very modern of like department stores, very high end restaurants, fashion where all the fashion trend is happening, and also like the biggest bookshop in Taipei. And then within like maybe half an hour walk, you'd be on a mountain. Like、wow. appreciating the whole of Taipei because you could sort of look down and you'd see Taipei One Hundred One surrounded by all the other buildings. So, for our listeners that don't know what Taipei One Hundred One is, could you just give us a brief sort of overview of what it is and its history? Um, so I think at some point, I'm not sure how long ago was that, but I'm pretty sure at some point in history, it was the tallest building in the world before the whatever that. Building in Dubai、uh, came over, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever that came over, but yeah, at some point it w- it was tall building, and then so Taipei One Hundred One is it has become the landmark, and it's a mixture of offices and department stores like the high end fashion brands like Gucci,、uh, Prada. I'm not sure. I I don't know much about、yeah. that, obviously. But then you can also. Um, go onto the very top, not on、um, not the very top floor, but really high up, and look down. I didn't do that because it's very expensive, and like, I don't think local people would pay that money to, to do, <laughs> do it, the、no. like a tourist thing. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's always whenever you live somewhere, you never do the tourist <laughs> stuff because it's your your city or town. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's、know? like coming to Durham, and I've like trying, I've been trying to get into like. The cathedral and the castle, but just postponed doing it because I'm living like sort of、yeah. around that place. So I'm here、yeah. with it. Yeah, I could go there any time, like、exactly. that. Yeah, that's one. So yeah, what other stuff would you recommend having a look at? Um, so I think it has something to do with um history. Is the sort of military village? I'd say. Um, I think it's really unique to Taiwan in the whole wide world because. Uh, our history with with China. So, after the Second World War, we entered a period of、uh, um, quote civil war unquote. Yeah. <laughs> it's like because now we're obviously independent countries, so it feels a bit weird to use the word civil. But at the time, we were sort of like ri- rivalry between the Communist Party of China and、uh, KMT Party, which is now in Taiwan. So it's taken from the Initials of the pronunciation called Guomindang, so like KMT. Yeah. And because of the civil war, the KMT government decided to 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 retreat to Taiwan. And so, because of all the、uh, the soldiers, the military people who came over with the government, they had they needed a place to live in with their family. So the government sort of circled several grounds so you could live here, build your houses with your family. And obviously, it wasn't great for,、um, in terms of culture with the local Taiwanese at the time, because the local Taiwanese has been governed by、uh, Japan since eighteen ninety five until nineteen forty five. Wow. So, yeah, so it's another war between the Chinese government at the time with with Japan when they were sort of expanding and invading Korea and and Taiwan and other parts. Of Asia, but because、um, the the U.S. sided with、uh, the sort of really mixed up, but、yeah. I'd say it's like the KMT,、uh, the Chinese government of the time. So they the China China won the war because of the U.S. help, and so the local Taiwanese governed by Japan sort of. View China as this their homeland hero,、yeah. but it's actually because of U.S. help that they won. Yeah. And in comparison to Taiwan ruled by Japan, who has been 
like receiving all the infrastructures, like modern uh, facilities and everything. The soldiers who came despised the local Chinese people because they think they were ruled by someone they have defeated. Oh, in Japan. Yeah. yeah. But then their behaviors are worse, viewed by Chinese people, worse than them because yeah. they would sort of be like their hygiene would be still kind of behind the time. Yeah. And so this sort of like misunderstanding in between and then given like the military village sort of separate locals with the Chinese soldiers. It's not great, and so they eventually um, sort of evolve into a sort of big conflict that's happened on the 28th of February. And after that, Taiwan went into a long period of white terror, which uh, when the freedom of speech and other rights weren't allowed, people would be suicided or just suddenly disappear. That just sort of so. Let's say you, I was living in Taiwan at that point, and I was speaking my mind, you know, talking bad about the government. I could literally just be taken away. Yeah. And the next day, again. your family wake up and find you disappeared. You'll be in your, you'll be asleep. You'll, be <laughs> you'll wake up. You wouldn't know where you were, and that's you're gone. That's, yeah. You're literally just gone. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you'd be erased in a way. That's what we're taught in, in history class. You'd be erased. Not it's like, it's like, you never existed, man. <laughs> it's like you just you just disappear. People don't yeah. know where you went. That's and and the they'd never story. find you. Uh, I'm not sure about that bit. We just sort of yeah. hear this, these kind of stories in class what, of what could happen at that time in history. Yeah. And so... Yeah, we were sort of talking about the village. So obviously they're not functioning now, but these buildings are left over, yeah, left over from that period. So you could see. I remember because that happens around my grandparents' generation. So my dad, who had a my grandpa, he is from one. Of, he's one of the soldiers who came over during that period. Soldier from China. Yeah. Yeah, and so my dad, as a kid, had actually lived in that village village, before and so people would sort of teach each other how to cook because they were from various parts of China and so my grandma also actually picked up a sort of like different ways of cooking during that period of time so I also get to experience like different cuisines in my in my house yeah and so like um Taiwanese local Taiwanese people are more familiar with uh rice and then people from China would be more familiar with like noodles, basically things made from wheat. Yeah. And so if you s- see something in Taiwan, if it's made from wheat or like uh, like the variety, so noodle would be because of that period of time, whereas rice would be more localized. I right, so again, if you see a so if you see a shop selling noodles, you must know there's some sort of Chinese history there. Yeah. Something going on. Yeah. So right. another thing was uh, called Yoromian, it's like beef noodles. That is also one thing. W- it wouldn't have existed if it weren't for that period of time. Yeah, so it's all sort of these things, that these events of history, they all sort of... Come an, together, yeah. yeah. <laughs> come together and have an impact today. You yeah. Know, to shape the modern yeah. world. So before World War Two, it was, it was Japan that sort of ruled Taiwan, wasn't it? Yeah, for... Uh, I'm terrible at math. So from... 1895 to 1945, that's 60? Yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you get the idea. <laughs> yeah. Last one. So, yeah, what was were you, what were you taught about the rule of Japan before World War II? What was it like? Uh, we were definitely taught about the um, more horrible parts of it, where people... Um, because we also have Aboriginal people, yeah. so we are also taught about how they were sort of massacred by the Jap- Japanese government because they were trying to resist and fight back. And same thing happens with local Taiwanese. But we are also taught about like how they brought modern infrastructure, hygiene concept into uh, the Taiwanese society. Yeah. So we're taught both sides, I'd say. So obviously, this, so they were when the Japanese originally came in. They yep. sort of murdered and slaughtered lots of the Aboriginal Taiwanese. Uh, no, only no. when they were trying to fight back. Oh, so like the those... people who were rebels. Then yeah, yeah, them. Okay. yeah, yeah. So was that 
widespread or not that much or how much how much sort of fighting back was there going on uh it's usually when the japanese government is trying to uh sort of impulse education on those people so that's or when like, there was the rebellions when, yeah when that happened yeah so when you say impose the education what sort of stuff were they trying to impose uh just on language i think maybe it's like obviously taiwanese people we uh people would be speaking taiwanese at the time yeah. i think i'm not 100 percent sure about that but i think taiwanese would be the mainstream and in some parts also uh hakka which is uh taiwanese and hakka is like the two biggest uh dialects in taiwan and so with the uh, aboriginals there would be people usually living in the mountains and local Taiwanese would be living in on the ground. Yeah. Nice. So um you know you said as well after World War Two, mm-hmm. when sort of China were imposing their will on Taiwan, if you spoke was it Mandarin? That yeah. Was... I think it's because they were trying to get rid of the Japanese influence. Yeah. So they were imposing Man- uh, Mandarin Chinese in education. So I've heard this from my parents because it's sort of their generation yeah. where at schools you would have to speak Mandarin and when you speak Taiwanese you'd be given this sort of thing you have to wear that says I have to speak Mandarin that written on it. Yeah, so it's like in the UK, like the Victorian era, we had like a dunce hat. So it's like this big white hat you'd have to wear. So let's say you got a few oh, questions. Cool. If you got a few questions wrong in uh, in school, you'd have to have this big hat that said, like, I'm an idiot, basically. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a you bit, You also know, had that in history. That's really cool to learn yeah, about. Yeah, so that's in, that's in uh, the Victorian era, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting how governments use the school system to sort of impose their will. Because if you think about it, if you can teach a generation of people that X is bad... And you don't like X, then yeah. you've just done something for your political system. Yeah. And you know, if I want to get rid of Japanese culture in Taiwan, I'm going to force you to speak my language. Yeah, I think that's another thing that's still happening right now because I've met uh, quite a few uh, exchange students from China in yeah. my home university, yeah. and they told me they were taught at how Taiwan is that is part of their territory. In yeah, schools, that's what they're taught in school. That yeah. Taiwan is part of China. Yeah, and obviously you're taught you're an independent country. Yeah, that's, that's the truth because you are. Like, yeah, so they yeah. were taught like Taiwan is part of China, and obviously when they came uh, and study, they learned that's not true because there is so much difference between. No, because they actually come and see. What, yeah, what the truth actually is, yeah. seeing that, and they would sort of admit how they were educated back in China. Was that wrong? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, because I wonder what other parts of Asia that China claim. I think there's a big claim of Tibet as well. Oh, yeah. yeah I've heard that, Tibet. And they just sort of, I think, I saw this map the other day. I walk, I'll get my editor to put it in. But, like, of all the countries that China said they have a claim to. <laughs> and it's, like, most of Asia. <laughs> like, I think that has to do with history. Yeah. Because sort of, sort of, like, expand to a lot of places in the really long course of history of maybe f- I think it's around 5,000 years so yeah. obviously there would be cultural influences everywhere because they've been there in the past yeah. hence the influence is still there in some way yeah yeah it's like you know if the if, if, if you know Britain was to do the same it'd be like well because we've got influences in Canada Australia US you sh- you're, all, you're all ours <laughs> and obviously that's not right it's, because mm. although there's that cultural link and everyone can appreciate that you're a separate country now so yeah you I've know, hope, yeah, I've never view it that way, but yeah, I think that's definitely true. Where the cultural link is what tied us all together, but not in political terms. No, it's not the same. It's not the same. We're very culturally similar to Europe, very culturally similar to most of the European countries in the UK, but it doesn't mean we're going to become one country. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, it's not how it works. Yeah. You know? So it is strange to you know force that upon a country as a justification for taking them over. You know, mm-hmm. and. Yeah, just to go on to something a bit, uh, a bit lighter now. Yeah, the, the, the this is a really heavy topic. Yeah, and I know, it's mental. Politically yeah. correct. <laughs> exactly. So if we go back to sort of uh, in school, you yep. talked about earthquakes happening. So, <laughs> I, so you're at school. What would have you ever had an earthquake happen at school? Or yeah. What happens yeah. then? So uh, people are just really 
chilled about it, obviously, because it happens ever so often. So I've seen several like international students in my home university, and they would be wanting to run out of the classroom. Yeah, they'd be panicking, yeah. and we were just all the Taiwanese students just. Yeah, it's fine. It will pass. <laughs> it's all good. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we have uh, back before high school level, we have um, earthquake drill every term, every semester. Yeah. The biggest one would be on um, the twenty first of September. It's because we had a really strong um, strike of earthquake in the year nineteen ninety nine. And a lot of people had died in that incident,、oh, no. so sort of、oh. like commemorates that we have earthquake drill every year on a day, and we have、um, a, like sort of like an education center set up because of that incident. Wow! So again, it just shows like there is measures being put in place to prevent something like that happen again. Yeah, because I noticed you have you, like here in the UK, you put things really high up in on the shelves. But、yeah. I just wouldn't do that in time because it very, it's very possible that it's gonna fall、Full、off during、plate. the earthquake. Yeah. <laughs> so you say as well that you, you drill everything to the walls. Yeah. Because obviously like, like the、yeah. cabinets and stuff, even if not like the, the even when not really tall or anything,、yeah. but just to be on a safe side would be better to drill them into the wall. Exactly, because if you don't, then it's gonna fall off and break. <laughs> you, you don't want it to break. So, so yeah. Wow. So let's say, what are you taught? What is what is the drill? What, what do you have to do if an earthquake、um, goes off? So usually, what because we the the drill will be in school, so it's like the procedures what to do if an earthquake strike when you are in school. Yeah. yeah. So there will be like the fake um announcements of the an alarm, earthquake、yeah. alarm go off with a oh oh speaking of alarm, we actually get like. Earthquake alert on our phone okay, when we're in Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that is that could actually you could because it's like this blaring alarm. So when you hear it, you know an earthquake is coming. And, and that's so, the exact alarm. Yep, that's the earth, that's the earthquake coming in. <laughs> <laughs> But like it's like in 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 school, you could when you hear that, everybody sort of like oh an earthquake is coming, and people tense up a bit. But、yeah. it's good because it also warns you about、uh, tsunami. I think we have that after, uh, twenty eleven, the one,、yeah. the biggest one in, in Japan. So did that affect Taiwan in any way? Did that come to you guys, or was it just Japan that was affected? Um, because of the current, so there were a period of time where people think it was unsafe to eat, uh, fish or something that sort of like along the current who which came from Japan at the time. Okay. But after a period of time, it. Uh, the experts have declared it safe, so people are, were okay with that. And so back to the earthquake drill, so that you'd have you'd have an an ex- announcement that goes like、uh, an earthquake's happening, and so we'd have to take our school bags and then put it over our head and stay. It changes over time, but、yeah. when I was Even younger, you were taught to hide under the table. But when I get old, when I got older, I was told to hide beside the table. I'm not sure what the procedure now,、What's、but it, do, it、yeah. just changes over time. And so, I think beside it,、um, I've from what I heard, when you're hiding beside the table, is、uh, safe so that you wouldn't get crashed if you're hiding under the table. Is something fall over. Okay, and so、sense. this sort、makes、of like、sense. a term called the golden triangle. It's like when you're sort of、um, right next to some, some maybe say a table, and then something fall over from your from the side, and so you get the table. You be sort of like leaning onto this table, and then the stuff that fall over will form a triangles, and you'd be safe in that triangle. But underneath not, the thing, that's... yeah, that's fallen off. But、yeah. I'm not sure if it's still because like these sort of things changes over the course of the years. So they change the procedure all the time. Yeah, yeah. So with like more research, they find out new ways to keep everybody safe, and so the things we learn changes as well. Exactly. It's like in the UK during the Blitz in World War Two, everyone was told just get under the desk, and also in the US when they had 
the Cold War nuclear threat. Oh. It was called the duck and cover drill. Uh-huh. So you'd go under the desk and sort of cover your head like that. Yeah. In like the sort of like brace position. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's interesting how that sort of changes. <laughs> so it, what's the worst earthquake you've experienced and where were you and how did it happen and what happened? Oh, I remember, uh, well, twice actually. One was when I was um, probably still in primary school and I was at the time being scolded by my mom with something yeah. else. That, that's probably the reason why I still remember it till this day. But then I remember I was um, really upset because obviously because I was scolded by my mom. Yeah. And then an earthquake strike and my mom just hugged me and we hid under the table and I remember being really scared but also protected because of my mom. Yeah, that was the that was one. And then another one was when I was maybe second year in university. And so I was in a basement in a restaurant and then the earthquake strike and it was quite a big one. So everything is was shaking and you could sort of the lights hanging from the ceiling just shaking really violently. Oh. Yeah, but we weren't trying to escape or anything. We we just sort of waiting for it to pass. Yeah, so everyone's pretty calm with it then. It yeah, <laughs> definitely. Oh, for fuck's sake, another earthquake! Come on, <laughs> hurry up! Any time now. <laughs> so, how regularly would they happen? Like every year, less than that, or more than that? Uh, actually, from what I've heard, is several times a day. A day, but, but most of the wow. scales is too small for you to feel it. Yeah. So I, I'd say like bigger ones where you can feel it would be once or twice a year. So like they happen all the time. They're just the ones you can actually feel. Yeah. Would be once or twice a year. Okay, so you, yeah, that's interesting. It would. Would it, would the damage be big after an earthquake, or, ju- or are, you, are the buildings set up now so they can deal with it? Or uh, it depends. the The damage really depends on how big the earthquake is. Yeah. But um, most of the buildings, like the newer buildings, would have to pass the earthquake test. Like so, it, even if it shakes during the the earthquake, it would be, it wouldn't collapse or anything. So that's also why I love like new like um, plans to sort of rebuild, uh, re- replace old buildings are happening in uh, Taiwan. We're sort of like getting rid of uh, the old buildings that doesn't sort of uh, align with the earthquake. Like exactly, and to make sure they pass yeah. the earthquake test. Yeah, as well. yeah, 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 yeah. Because you know. There's no point building a building that's going to fall over if there's an earthquake. Yeah. I remember a few years back when I went to London with my parents. And so we were on like a bus tour or something. And then the guy was talking about how he pointed to a building and said, this is the only building in London or is it the UK? I'm not sure. To have like earthquake proof. And it is sort of funny because we have that in Taiwan, like basically. Every building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so for you guys, this is special. Every building's protected, eh? Like, yeah, yeah. But like, it's, I feel like fire is more a thing here because yeah, every door is fire door and they're really heavy and you just close and then like, like sort of bang. You get woken up because like, uh, I live in college and those doors are really heavy. So yeah, you get woken up by massive. the doors yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the morning. Honestly. Yeah, so I think that's isn't interesting how different countries perceive different natural events as threats or lesser threats. Yeah, like, obviously we don't have snow like snowstorm. No, yeah. <laughs> no, no snow mobiles going about. So no. yeah, it's just that. But yeah, so like going back to school. So obviously, other than being taught about earthquakes, what would sort of the curriculum be? What are you taught about? What are the main subjects? Um, so I think from yeah, from what I heard from other. Uh, British people here, we have a very different education system. So basically, everybody su- study the same subject throughout. Yeah. Um, Mandarin, English, math, um, uh, sociology, and then science. Science, yeah. But we're sort of like dividing them up into different subjects. So like with science, you get. Earth science, biology, chemistry, and physics. So you learn about earth science specifically as well. Yeah. Wow, that's and interesting. And then I I don't even know why, but it just sort of happens. Yeah. <laughs> and then with uh, sociology, you get um, uh, it's called civics, but I'm not sure. It has like economies, politics, 
and other things for maybe international relations as well. Yeah, so that and probably law. Be, yeah. Yeah, and and then geography and history. Yeah, so if that if civics was in the UK, it'd be called citizenship. Oh so yeah, that's our yeah, equivalent maybe. of what you do. And yeah, we also have other subjects that we we do. So we have a big focus on drama. Oh, that's so yeah, cool. Drama. <laughs> Just uh, imagine having drama. Did you do drama as your subject? No, so I did it up to uh, year year ten. So year ten is when you choose your subjects. But before that, everyone does everything. Uh huh. So you do drama. So you get taught how you just get taught how to act. Wow. Do little plays. That's... Learn different things. Do you act in them as well? Or do you put on your own plays? It depends if you want to. Like the schools oh. do play, so if you want to join the play, you can do it. But if you okay. don't want to, all you do is just little ones and lessons, which are a bit of fun. And then you do art as well, so you get taught how to start like, draw, paint, stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah, we do. We have that as well. Nice. And then we have DT, which is design and technology, so like woodwork. So you get taught how to sort of make stuff. So you learn how to use like saws, you know, other equipment how to design stuff, how to go through the manufacturing process. So, you know, you learn all that sort of as well. So that's pretty cool. I think we also have that in middle school and high school, but they are sort of neglected. Yeah, it's not <laughs> many people do them, yeah. But I think, yeah, it's cool. So, and obviously when you get a bit more specialised in the UK, when you do your A-levels, so your high school, you'd, uh, you'd have other subjects like sociology, philosophy, you don't need politics as a GCSE unless you go to a school that does it but not many schools okay. do and yeah then from that you can go progress and get more specialised and do other stuff as well but you said as well your sort of three years of high school are different aren't they because we only have two years it's called sick form so it's different so how, what is it like at high school in Taiwan I think oh this is actually discussed in one of our episodes called Everything Academia we have this sort of uh, it's a bit like um, society culture here in Durham. So you get, um, we call them clubs. So the biggest one would be a dance club or yeah. a guitar club where people just gather together. And it's called extracurricular activities, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. actually compulsory. Really? You get like, yeah, you get two hours at school time to do that. And yeah. the only difference is if you're like more involved in the dance club or the guitar club or the bigger ones you have to spend your after school hours doing those activities as well but with like smaller ones you usually don't yeah so we have a similar thing on, a, on my old school on a, on a wednesday afternoon you'd have like a two-hour block where you can choose to do whatever you want whether that we go to the gym play rugby play football do art do some science anything it was just there to sort of whatever you want to do do it sort of thing so that's quite similar to what you said there but it was kind of forced, but it wasn't at the same time in that you could literally do anything you want. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a sort of similar sort of thing with the extracurricular stuff as well. Because I, I feel like because it's it's sort of way, I think, with this um, sort of society culture in high school in Taiwan, it's sort of a way to liberate yourself almost in a way. So sort of because you have so much schoolwork and that's the only way you could get away from it. And some people would use it as a, a chance to rebel against their parents because their parents yeah. don't want them to do that. So they just go into it. Yeah. Yeah. So the parents would be like, don't do the guitar club. <laughs> They'd be like, I'm going to do the guitar club. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. So you said at high school you have three years. What's mm-hmm. that like? How is that broken up and what are you taught in each in each year? Um, so for the first year, er, well, maybe for the three years, everybody just pretty much have the same subject. But in the first year, you take everything I just said. And at the end of the year, you, you'd you be given the choice to choose between uh, the, the sort of um, expertise of science and humanities. But it's like a really broad and general sort of concept in your second year because uh, you ca- you have the university entrance exam in the first half of your third year so it doesn't feel like it makes much difference at that time so with uh, in the second year people who do science have to learn everything and stay at school for more hours but yeah. with people who do humanities they have like maybe a little bit less science subjects to like they divide it up into two like two halves 
for the full academic year, but with people who do science, they have to do it every term. Oh, nice. It just depends on what subjects you want to do later on, or yeah, where you want to take stuff. Yeah, and so in terms, I think most of parents would want their kids to do science because a lot of parents, you know, maybe get that from typical Asian, like <laughs> uh, stereotypical parents is people. Parents want their kids to maybe be a lawyer, be a doctor. That's definitely true. Yeah. Is it like also like that here or so again, no? It really depends on who your parents are. So you can have parents who, although have been successful themselves, are very hands off. They're like, you do whatever you want. Yeah. Or you have some parents who are like you're doing this, 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 this all the time. So it's very varied. But yeah, you know, what would sort of like your experience? Like, would you say you were quite pressured to do to succeed, or would you say not really? I, I'm. I think I'm really lucky because my parents are the sort of people who don't pressure me into doing anything. They yeah. let me explore what I want to do. Exactly. So I'm very lucky. But I do have a lot of friends who, their parents would direct them what they should do and yeah. stop them from doing what they want to do. Exactly. But half of the friends I have, I I know or like people I know would rebel against that. So yeah. <laughs> it's actually it's sort of like a thing you joke about in high school. Is that I have a fight with my parents the other day. I don't care about them. <laughs> yeah, oh, screw my parents. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think that's the same here as well. Like, if you're the more your parents try and control you, the more you're going to rebel. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's, it's the same everywhere else in the world. It's anywhere. Think, yeah. No matter what culture you're in, what part of the world, it's the same thing. Yeah. You know? So they'll go, you got to do this. You can't join the guitar club. You're going to go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna do it. <laughs> no, you're not. I am. <laughs> now, honestly, like, it's like I think because again, same with me. Because my parents are very like, you do whatever you want. You know, it's your your life. You want to do this. You want to make a mistake. You got you got to learn from the mistakes. So yeah, make the mistakes. Whereas if they'd have been with my personality type, if they'd have said to me, yeah, you know, you're 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 not doing that. I'm like, no, 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 I, I am. <laughs> it's like for me, like I sort of push the boat a bit. So sometimes they're like, nah, you should, it's unsafe. Shouldn't do that. I'm like well, I'm fine, I'm going to do it, and you're going to see me do it, and then that'll be it. <laughs> so, yeah. Another thing about the uh, school system that I thought was interesting is you said that, what's it called, you learn about different parts of the world in different years. So it was like Chinese and was it Taiwanese history and then yeah. world history. Yeah. Uh, so, in specific, in high school, so I can't really remember much about it before high school. Yeah, neither can I. Yeah. Really. <laughs> so I think you learn sort of... Um, in your first term of the first year, you learn about Taiwanese history. If this is not like has anything to do with political. It is like the sort of geological of Taiwan and geologically of China. So it's just yeah. like yeah, it's not political at all. And so in the first term of first year, you do Taiwanese history and Taiwanese geography, and then uh, from the second term of first year to your uh, first term of your second year, you do uh, Chinese history and Chinese geography, and then the last semester of the second year would be world history and world geography. Nice. So when you're taught about China, what are you taught about them first of all? And then are you, you know, what are you taught about them in a positive or negative way, or sort of neutral? I think it's pretty much neutral, because I think it's more divided by because of this thing happened in this part of China so it's Chinese history this thing happened in this part of Taiwan so it's Taiwanese history yeah so it's kind of neutral to me I don't know about the people I'm a people there are people who try who are trying to say we need to get rid of Chinese history but I think because we're culturally linked we sort of I I'd want to learn about where I come from so I'd yeah. want to know about Chinese history um, so we're basically taught <laughs> what happened in the past 5,000 years. 5,000 <laughs> years? Yeah. Really? That far back? I think, yeah. Yeah. Bloody hell. We only learned like 500 and then a little bit about the Romans and the Celts when you're really young. So wow. you're not taught that, that much. So you're the most we're going back, I mean, apart from like Egypt, which we're talking about as well. Apart from that, you're sort of going back 2,000 years. That's wow. It. Obviously, Egypt's a lot further back. But like, <laughs> there's a big gap between Egypt and Romans, which like, what happened there, you know? 
We, I think we should talk about it in like in the chronological way. Yeah, so yeah. we start with the very beginning of like maybe Taiwan. We have like, uh, you know the I don't even know the English word for it, but. Uh, the Bronze Age or something. Yeah, so Stone Age, like Bronze yeah, Age. Yeah, yeah. So like stuff they dug up in archaeology, and then you move on to other parts chronologically. And with Chinese history, it's basically the same. And world history, uh, like maybe Greek, Egyptian, like an ancient mytho- ancient history, and that, and then move on to. I think it's called world history, but it's. Very much. That's a bit weird, but it's yeah. Western focused. So they say this is like the European. whole world. It's just, uh, <laughs> just European and America. Yeah. 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 Mostly European and America. A bits of uh, Japan <coughs> as well, and bits of Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. But weirdly, mostly focused on Europe and the US. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, what again? What you talk about? Europe and the, just like the objective facts or like other yeah, stuff. yeah basically facts, the right? facts of what happened um maybe like world wars and then like industrial revolution enlightenment that sort of thing yeah nice one so um at school you talk about faith or religion at all is there a subject about faith or not no i've heard that some someone said you have theology but we don't have that yeah so we have a university you have theology and uh lower levels at secondary school and at sixth form you have religious studies so you can cool we don't have that at all so you'll learn about all different religions of western and eastern religions you know all all the abrahamic religions like you know christianity judaism islam i think that's maybe incorporated in history when we talk about history historical yeah yeah whereas we'd learn it to learn about the faith itself oh what it's like what do you learn about them? So it'd be like, this is what the religion does. These are their main holidays. These are what they believe. This is their key text. This is their holy places. This is how you practice this religion. This is what it's like to go to a church or other sort of religious building service on this religion. Oh. So you just learn about all of that, sort of like about the That's how very works. fascinating, really. Yeah, so you, <laughs> you would not have that at all. No, we right? were just sort of taught how they sort of like the origin of this religion and that's it. This is where it came from. That's it. <laughs> yeah. You don't need to know anymore. Just this. <laughs> That's yeah. fair enough. So you said, uh, what's so what is sort of the main faithful religion in in Taiwan? Uh, I'd say Taoism. It's sort of like a bit more like, um, I wouldn't say superstition, but closer to that in yeah. in a sense. Yeah, people just we have a lot of temples and people just visit them whenever they feel the need to. So like before you travel you could sort of go in there and say please grant me a safe travel or like people who go in and ask stuff because we have like um i think this really unique thing is called um in taiwanese so you get like a pair of um it's called jiao. it's um a red sort of like half moon shaped uh thing <laughs> and then you sort of like throw them onto the ground and get your answers from the gods so yes you, you ask a question you throw the thing and you get your answer so what does the thing do like when you throw it it just like lands on the ground and then or? um so if it's um to like both side up and yeah. both side down that are both no, but okay. if it's like one side up and one side down, that's a yes. Wow, so then that could like alter your decision. So say <laughs> like, right, should I buy this new car? <laughs> yeah, people Throws the thing, <laughs> guess it's a no. Yeah, yeah that'll be people, it. Yeah, people do, do do that, but with like, more like, should I pursue like a career or should, should I? What life path to take. Yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. Okay. That's or what is I'm this the right person to sort of marry or something like that? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so that makes sense. So then bigger sort of macro life choices. Because, you know, it's often with these choices, you feel, you know, it's such a big choice, you never know what way to turn. So it must be good to sort of have that other thing, other sort of like, you know, the gods sort of turn yeah. to. And then, you know, get an answer. You can, you can, you know, you know for sure what way to turn then. I feel that sort of the essence in any faith or religion is sort of like uh, seeking answers where you don't know where to no, exactly, because yeah. there's that like gap of what what do I do, what what should I do now? <laughs> so having that sort of thing there is, is good because it gives you that sort of 
answering, you know, whatever way you choose. As you, and as well, what is the sort of, is there a God? Are there multiple gods? What, how does Taoism work? Or is there a God? Multiple gods, but they're a bit like they have their own hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, so, like, so you yeah. get like a really vague sense of um, sort of like the sky. Like he's yeah. the, the sort of, he's the top of them all. And under that you have various different gods, and under that you have various different gods, and under that you have very different gods. Yeah. So there's a whole pyramid then. So, what are some of the uh, some of the top ones? What do they do? What are they protecting you? Or what are they, what's, yeah, what's um, the purpose? It really depends on the temple, because I think Taoism is a mixed bag of a lot of religions. You see, you get like. Uh, the local superstitions you get some gods from Buddhism as well you get some gods from traditionally Taoism belief and so it really depends on what they what is the sort of specialty of the temple so yeah. with the different temples you also get like different specialties so this temple might be specialized in uh, the love god this special temple may this temple may be specialized in other stuff so you go to different temples for a different purpose and there's one i uh i went when i was when i was going to get my college and uh, university entrance exam it's because that temple specializes in academic performance yeah <laughs> so you also like with the god you also there are like do's and don'ts so for example the the god who protects your sort of academic work his ride is an ox so you don't eat beef really yeah would that be ever or just during this period just of time? during that period so you have like you sort of go in the temple the sim the most similar word would be pray so you get your the this incense and you praise the gods and say please help me with this thing and then if the thing but even if it doesn't you would sort of go back to the temple after a period of time and say thank you for doing this for me so it's um it's called huan yuan so the translation would be giving back your wish so okay. it's like re repaying like paying back your respect or something and so that's sort of usually the period when you stop doing the things that you should do okay so that's like you you put the message in you've done the prayer then you obviously hope or pray that it comes, yeah. comes through yeah. <laughs> it works and then afterwards there's that period of closing where you'll go okay thank you and then you can start doing the thing you were stopped doing yeah because yeah. it's like closed it's like you've closed the book now you yeah, can move yeah. on yeah basically like that and you also get well I said the um, the love god <laughs> yeah. a lot of people would um, pray for like maybe a partner or something so it's basically the same process you go in do a prayer and after a period of time or if you find a partner you go back and say thank you nice and just by doing that that's sort of the that's the process yeah so there's no sort of fixed service there wouldn't be like a service like you'd have in a church that wouldn't be a thing or is that a thing it's I think there is, but I'm not sure because I've never attended anything like that. No, so so yeah. I think those those are for really uh, devoted people. But for most people, we just go into temples to ask for something. <laughs> that sounds really selfish, but it's just really how it works, really. Nice. So um, what you said as well, like different regions have different... <laughs> so we'll just try and explain that to our listeners how that works it's a very complicated thing if you're not from Taiwanese culture to explain it's sort of um, so there is a god called Tu Di Gong Tu Di is like the land Gong is for like a respectful way of addressing a male figure okay so it's like sir yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then so with this god, he sort of he's sort of like having different divisions in different regions. Right. So for example, taking the color system in term, for example, as so different regions. Yeah, yeah. If, as different regions. So you get like Saint John's right next to Saint Cuthbert's, Cuthbert's, Cuthbert's yeah, yeah. right. So people who from Saint John's would have 
a division, and then people from cars will have a division, and they cannot cross over to each other's temple to to pray because it wouldn't work.、Right. It has to be yours for it to work. Exactly, because if the god of my land is at a certain temple, there's no point <laughs> me praying for my land at the god for a different piece of land. Like, like even with a really small region, with actually like Saint John's and Cars. So even that small, it can be、yeah. like really that small. Yeah, like, it can be really that small.、Like、the next street worship Saint John's. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So yeah, go there and do that. So ha- there must be a lot of temples or places. Then could it be sort of shrines as well, so sort of smaller stuff? Or, yeah, yeah. It、yeah. could just be like. A really small shrine have a statue of it there, and that's it. And you get、yeah. also really big temples where you have several feet tall statues. Wow! So it does really depend on where you yeah, are. Yeah, it really depends、yeah. on the temples. Yeah. And is there a centralized body of Taoism that runs everything, or is it sort of each individual place runs it the way they want to run it? I think it's the latter, because it's、yeah. sort of like it runs. So long in history and has incorporated so many different things in them.、Yeah. So people just take it the way they sort of believe it. Yeah, because like you know, there's no way they could say because not every region's been through the same history. So you can't have the same religious system because it's not been through the same process of getting the religious system. Yeah, it's really. I think it would be really tailored to people. Yeah, in、definitely. in that sense, yeah. Yeah, because like. It's a very personal thing, religion as well, because it's what you believe. But obviously, if you have similar belief with others, you're gonna go to the same place to do that thing. But if you don't, then it wouldn't make sense to go to that place if you believe something different, sort of thing. Yeah, it's maybe a bit like you have many different branches of Christianity yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's very confusing because <laughs> you only have one God, and how could you have so many different <laughs> branches? It is it's insane. <laughs> like, like the amount of different sects of Christianity is mental. There's like. I could even say how many there are, a lot, a lot. <laughs> and they all sort of come from different places. Different again, it's the history. The history has made it different because、oh. they've had the different experiences. Like for example, in the UK, you've got sort of the main two big ones are Protestantism and Catholicism,、uh-huh. and it's there was this division. Oh between, yeah, that's basically because of Henry that he wanted Henry, to get there for us, and then、yeah. <laughs> that's why I learned. And this man called Martin Luther as well. Yeah, he wanted to change the church, but yeah. So basically, that sort of split because one side believed, you know, worshiping. God was done through worshiping icons and worshiping. I mean, these really fancy golden churches, and the other side were like, "That's not the way of doing it. We want to have a sort of quite basic church, which has the nice essential stuff, and it'd be more sort of sort of wooden, stone, but one side wanted the gold, so it's like yeah, it's different. But again, they're all sort of doing they're doing different things for the same end goal. If that makes sense. I also f- yeah, but it's like I also find the sort of. Um, structure of a church a bit weird because you get、yeah. the graveyards on the outside and you walk、oh, you through the, actual,、yeah. the, you, the through the graveyard into the church. That is weird, isn't you it? Just, you just walk、that. past dead people on the way. It's just that's、really、it's unnerving、weird. in a, in a way because in Taiwan it's sort of like a taboo thing to be living next to a graveyard. So you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't want to do no. it. No. No. No, you、yeah. wouldn't want to. Like those houses would be so cheap. <laughs> no one wants to be there. No, because no yeah,、way. because no one wants to be there. Exactly. No, so like as well, you would just not not be part of that. No way. I I wouldn't want to, but there are people who don't mind and could live in that place. But I just couldn't. No, because yeah, when you think so, a temple would be nowhere near a graveyard. They would. They would be separated. There would be places like maybe. Because like the biggest temple in Taipei, the temple itself and the burial place is quite. It's not a burial place. It's like people get cremated and they、yeah. put into different sort of chambers, but they're not at all related. They're just sort of close to each other. The two buildings, they won't be in the same building. No. no. So what's interesting now as well is cathedrals. They house people who have died. So like in London, you've got like Westminster Cathedral, which houses loads of kings and queens. Yeah, I've I've been there and seen it. It's it's very nice to see the history be out of it, but it's sort of unnerving. Well, it's so like, that's, that's they're lying dead, dead in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because、like, I don't know because it's just so normal in the UK and in like Europe to have like dead people or like you know people's sort of tombs be in a church or in a cathedral. It's just like, that's a normal thing. And for you to say that was really interesting to me because like 
<laughs> now that I think about it, that is quite weird. Do you know what I mean? That is quite weird to have that just there. Maybe because they're viewed as saints or like um, religiously moral people, so it's good to have them there. In yeah. Area, so maybe. like <laughs> the way the way cathedrals are in many UK and European cities, they're like the hub of the the place. It's like Durham. The oh. cathedral is the centre of Durham, and these are sort of the spiritual homes of the place. So because of that, they want the leaders and the people of significance to go inside. So it's like they're being returned to the spiritual home of the place. Oh. So, sort of like the village or any place would be built around, around the, the church, church or the cathedral. Yeah. Oh. So, like, look at Durham. It's all built around the cathedral, isn't it? It's all sprung up around the cathedral and around the river. Wow, I've never yeah. thought of it that way. But, yes, it is true. Yeah. And what's also interesting as well of a lot of places is the biggest building in a city or town sort of defines the culture of the town. So if you look at Durham, Durham's quite a Christian place, quite mm-hmm. a religious place, mm-hmm. because the biggest building is a cathedral. It's a cathedral. <laughs> so let's say, for example, London, the biggest building is the Shard, which is a building which is basically a shrine to capitalism, because it's a massive sort of building <laughs> with restaurants, office blocks, uh, hotels. It's there to sort of, you know, you go, look at me. And that's because London's a big economic hub, and it's a massive, you know, massive economic city. And its main, the spirit of London is is money, really. To be sort of brutal, that is it. It's <laughs> like there's money. It's just sort of driven Capitalism. by that. Yeah. So that just shows you. Like if you go to so many sort of like cities in sort of Poland and stuff as well, the biggest building is a cathedral. And again, it's quite a, it's a massively religious place because of that. Because that's what you're seeing. That's, that's what your eyes are seeing. That's the biggest building. That's a very different concept because I think maybe in Taiwan people come to get that, people come together first. And then they build temples. Yeah, so it's like the community's made, then the temple's built. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas here it's like monks or sort of religious people would build the building around obviously like a main settlement bit, like a, a river. A lot of the, every bit major city in the UK is on a river of some sort because that's how they sort of like you know live because they have the natural water source. Yeah, I think sort of, that's you know, that's true in in Taiwan as well. I'm sure of most places, I'm yeah. pretty sure, because I've always water have, exactly because otherwise how are you going to drink because you wouldn't have it attacked. <laughs> So yeah, but no, another thing I'd say as well, just sort of one of my final points is in school, you were, what would you say were some of the things you learned that were kind of weird now that you've sort of grown up, you've gone that, but that wasn't true. Are there any things you've you've sort of grown up and gone that wasn't correct? Or has most of it been sort of like, you know, the same? What, in which sense? In sort of like, you've been taught something at school and now that when you've gone up and looked around the world and explored the world, you've gone that isn't true. Would you say there is anything or not really? I'm not really sure. What I experience here is like people here are. I'm really sorry, but I feel like you because you're more specialized in your own expertise. Yeah. You're more ignorant in other aspects, whereas yeah. us, we're not that specialized, but we're more knowledgeable in and a more different things. way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing. I think another thing I was sort of taught as well is you want to you want to be very general. You want to know a lot about a lot of things, but you want to know an extreme amount about one thing yeah it's hard to find the balance because exactly. sometimes I find people really ignorant about uh, our part of the world whereas we're not about you know yours about our part of the world yeah. yeah but you don't know about ours and we no, have yeah. to fight our way into a place into yours because yeah. with um, it could, this could be a little political but one thing... We're not afraid of politics on this podcast. <laughs> one not thing I do whenever I see the world map is to find whether Taiwan is on the map or not. Really? Yeah. Many times oh. Taiwan would not be on a map. It's just not on the map. <laughs> it's just not on the map. It's just not on the map. And I'm just like, why is it on the map? Like, <laughs> it's, a, it's not like a proper map, more like a drawing of a world. Yeah. Like the things you can find in Starbucks things you can find in like maybe General TV arts shows. Of worlds, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, the first thing I do when I see when like especially in T V shows when yeah, a show like yeah. a world map, I find if Taiwan's on there or not, half of the time we wouldn't be on there. <laughs> it's a really sad thing to think about. Oh, and it's like if you guys did a map, we'd be on it. Yeah. We're not, <laughs> not gonna be on the map, are we? We're gonna wipe out the UK like. <laughs> And that's so weird because you guys acknowledge and recognise our culture and study it. Yeah. and learn about it in, de- in depth, as you said, for an entire year. And then we don't... Okay, if, if you didn't specialise in Chinese history or sort of Taiwanese history or sort of Asian history, you would know nothing, not wow. a thing about it. 
because you're not taught about it at all. You'd have no knowledge of Asia at all, apart from maybe a little bit in geography. But that'd be it. It's something I find. I don't know if it's better to specialize or not. No, I don't think so. I think, I think that is the point. You're meant to. You're meant to have the base, the generalization. You're meant to know loads about loads, and then Go a, lot, into, a lot about one thing, yeah. or maybe two things, three things. But you know, having a key. I think you need to know about the world. You need to know about every culture, because imagine if we didn't have this conversation and I went on my holidays to Taiwan. I'd have no clue. I'd have no clue at all. What would I? I wouldn't know anything. Because and that's the thing, because people don't get that there is a whole world out there. It's not just the UK. It's not just Taiwan. There's a whole world. Yeah. And you have to look at the whole world and then explore the whole world. Because by doing that, you, you learn so much. Like Even by going and sort of speak to people from different countries, you, you pick up so much. and You get that unique perspective that you wouldn't have if you didn't do that. That's, that even with like people who've never gone outside their own country, like because most of my flatmates, they pretty much stayed their whole life here. In the UK, yeah, yeah. yeah. But even when I talk to them, because I'm from a different cultural con- context, course, yeah. we get these sort of sparks between our conversation. We They learn from me, and I learn from them as well. The and point. I think that's exactly. the best, best thing about being inside a different culture. Of course, at times, I just find things really, really weird to me. But yeah, yeah. most of the time, I learn something new. And I hope it's something my podcast and you... Uh, the Lotus podcast we're bringing to the world. <laughs> exactly. So through, t- through today, we've got a very unique experience of Taiwan and a little bit of my, my ignorance and now non-ignorance. We've learned a lot. <laughs> and yeah, so a question I always ask every single guest is if you had a massive billboard, a massive sign that the entire world could see, what would it say and why? You mean about Taiwan? or uh, Whatever you no. want to say, but if you want to make it about Taiwan, that's fine. Just a big sign that everyone in the world has to see. What would it say? Big sign around the world. This is a very. I know, we get this reaction every time, because yeah. It, <laughs> because, well, since we've been talking about Taiwan, I definitely want to make it about Taiwan. The one thing I put on there is really simple just, we're here. We are here. Yeah. <laughs> we're on the map. We're here. We're not bloody China. We're our own independent country. No one can change that. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think that's that's pretty amazing. We're here. And it means a lot as well. It's not personal sort of national level. Bang. It's both personal and because I'm in different cultural contexts, exactly. I want to say I'm here. Exactly. But also at a national level, we want to say we're here. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, the key things I'd say from this episode is go and check out Without a Compass with Bethany. What they do over there is amazing. And, you know, we've given you a little sort of taste of what they do over there. And if you want to learn more about Taiwan or just have any other questions about how different cultures come together, then that's the place to do it. And, and yeah, how often do you guys publish when you when you usually upload? Uh, we upload every Wednesday in the morning through Purple Radio On Demand. Uh, but we also have our own podcast playlist called Without a Compass. You can find us on Instagram at underscore without a compass. And you can also send messages to us through the link in our home bio. Nice, and we'll put all them links in the show, show notes <laughs> for, this, for this video as well. So, last one, thank you so much, Bethany. And this has been the Lawless Podcast, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much. Bye.